Kalado, Aki, sweet potato, yam, banana, and tomato, cabbage, spinach, avocado, chow chow, butter, bean, and cocoa, courgette, millet, plantain, rice and peas and pumpkin, mango, dates and guava, chickpeas and cassava. The Negev Desert in the southern part of Israel. There is a place called Demuna that has about 33,000 residents, which about 5,000 of them is a part of a community called the Black Hebrew Israelites, which are a group of ex-African American people who claim to be descendant from the Hebrews from Jerusalem. When the Romans attacked Israel, their ancestors fled into Africa and mostly to West Africa. Hundreds of years went by and then slave traders came along and brought them over to America which they remained to modern time till they went back to Liberia and then back to Israel. They also have a strong faith that Israel is not a part of the Middle East. They actually believe that the land of Israel is actually part of Africa. They live a very healthy lifestyle where they don't smoke, they avoid chemicals, eat very little sugar and salt, and they're vegan, which is why they have the best longevity in all of Israel. They made a community for themselves, an idyllic vegan society, a full-on vegan population, which is why we figured out we had to go and visit them ourselves. When we first came to Demona, we were given 13 apartments. Okay? Yeah. And, of course, uh, we continued to grow, but the apartments didn't expand. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, these apartments were like uh, two bedroom apartments for what, four people? <laughs> yeah. Four or five people? But because of the uh, more of our people coming from America, natural births, we began bursting out of those 13 apartments. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> you know, we would have maybe 20 people in an apartment that was for five people. Okay, so uh, that made it uh, kind of difficult because we had to share space, we had to share resources. Uh, gradually, we began to get a few more apartments, but we had uh, our spiritual leader, Ben Ami, befriended the mayor of the uh, city. His name was Jack Amir. And Jack Amir was so impressed about our mission to the land of Israel that uh, he gave us an opportunity to move here. And this was, like I told you, an abandoned absorption center. Yeah. Which means that many of the windows was gone, the doors was gone, <laughs> uh, electrical uh, wiring had to be redone, plumbing. So uh, we had to invest almost a million and a half shekels. Oh, wow. Which we had to do collectively. And we oh. took each area of this particular absorption center and begin to upgrade it. So today, it has become one of the model communities of Demona. <laughs> okay, uh, we have many tour buses that come and visit us, uh, just as we hosted you today. Yeah. Many people receive the historical over overview and then we take them on a tour of the community and one of the stations that they always want to go to and like now they always want to go there first we produce the best glida the best ice cream in the world oh really none dairy no cholesterol <laughs> okay uh <clears throat> no additives you know no synthetic uh artificial flavoring everything is natural okay <laughs> yeah so they always want to go to the ice cream parlor first because they always learn that we always sell out Oh. Okay. So you gotta, <laughs> you're going to get a chance today. <laughs> Sounds great. Shalom, shalom. I was absolutely impressed with the amount of meat replacements that they were able to produce. And also the amount of food that they were able to grow in the desert. It sort of felt strange to find a vegan convenience store in a place that is so isolated. It was more inspirational than anything else. We have entered Gan Hasignon, or the Garden of Style, okay? And this is our On Kifar boutique. 
Ooh. of high fashion <laughs> of our community. <laughs> high, high fashion. This is the high and this is the Saks Fifth Avenue and the, uh, what is it, uh, Nordstrom. And this is our high class uh, boutique. And if you pan, you will see everything is handmade here. Most things are handmade. Wow. We do get some things from the continent, from some of our brother and sister um, jurisdictions on the continent, Kenya, Ghana. But the clothing are all styled and sewn here in, um, in Ghana Signal. Wow. Uh, all of the designs are specially designed. And as uh, Sar was saying, we wear only pure fabrics. So we have the gauze, the linens, the silks. This is silk. Hold on a second. Did she just say silk? While recording, I just thought to myself, this can't be real silk. But I was wrong. Silkworm produces their own cocoons in order to turn into another creature that has wings and can reproduce. In original silk production, they waited till the cocoon was empty, but today that is no longer the case. Today they boil the cocoons with the alive insect inside, and then they're harvested, and this is done on small scale and in really huge scales. Silk is not classified as vegan, and this is something the black Hebrew Israelites should know about. 100% um, cottons, and on the borders of our clothes we have the fringes, and as you see on mine, the cords of blue. Yeah. So the fringes and the cords of blue are to remind us of the law, yeah. the Ten Commandments, to remind us of the law and to spread that truth to the four corners of the earth. So mm. you will see the cords of blue on the four corners yeah. of our garments. I got a really interesting question yes. because many of the anti-vegans in Norway say that, oh, but you can't make real food, real clothes uh, unless you have synthetic without using animal products. What would you say, to about, say no, to that? No, um, cotton is 100%. Is, is yeah. uh, there are no synthetics used in cottons. Yeah. There are no synthetics used in linens. There are no synthetics used in wool. There's mm. no synthetics used in Yeah, silk. but wool is still an animal product, though. Yes, but yeah. you're not harming the animal. Well, actually, in 99% of wool production, this is actually not the case. Sheep are today bred to have an unnatural amount of fur that they grow. This has led to it being actually a necessity to cut their hair. And the reason why they still continue to do it is because there still is a demand. And when the sheep gets old and cannot produce wool fast enough, they will be sent to the slaughterhouse. The only ethical way to produce wool, in my opinion, would be if they are sanctuary animals, where they are only shortcut and not skinned, and the products are not sold for commercial reasons. Just as silk, wool is not classified as vegan. Priests and the prophets of Israel were anointed with oil. Okay, so once you're... again, this is our queen mother, Kanina. Yeah. This is uh, the queen mother of our community. And this is her 100th year since, uh, cen what is it, cen centurion? Mm -hmm. she's, cent she's our first centurion. Centurion, right. Yes. Centurion. <laughs> yes, and we love her dearly. And she just won a 20 meter race. Okay. Yeah. Yes, she did. <laughs> and she's coming from a uh, a program where they they uh, senior a senior program where our elders come together and they do all types of activities and just yeah. have a wonderful time. You look wonderful for your age. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons why she looks like that. That's right. She never went to a hospital right. in America. She didn't go oh, yeah. to the <laughs> hospital until she came here for a checkup. Yeah. We right. just wanted to send her there to you know check the vital signs, you right. know, blood pressure and all of that. Yeah. But that's something we need to remember. This is the she testimony. She never been to a hospital until she came here. Yeah. This is the testimony of veganism. Yeah. <laughs> the testimony. The testimony. <laughs> yes, she is. The first is the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about it, it in religious terms. We're talking about the initial sacred innate understanding that man had 
in the beginning, okay, because if we look at the longevity of man in the beginning, it was much longer than what it is today. Okay, Adam, you know, 930 years. Uh, you have people 950. Uh, Methuselah, you know, he's got the top record for 969. But we're in, uh, we want to challenge that longevity of Methuselah. Yeah. Okay, we want to go past that. But before you can go past that, you've got to uh, psychologically, mentally, and spiritually, and physically prepare yourself for a challenge. Okay, so when we talk about Holy Spirit, we talk about the ability to hear truth, discern it, and apply it. How often do people exercise there? Well, we recommend three times a week. Yeah. Okay, but you don't have to come here. You can have a regimen at your home, uh, and then what makes it easier for us, uh, brothers and sisters, they go and get one another to join them, you know, because when you got that collective, you got that collective energy that gives you the initiative to continue to uh, develop good habits and continue to uh, apply them. This is basically the studio they use for like workout, training, dancing and, and, and whatever. It's, it's, yeah, I would say it's a mid-sized one. But it's very well put together. Nothing is better than joining a dancing class for a little exercise. As you've seen, this is only one of many types of exercise these people are doing every single week. They run, they go to the gym, they do all sorts of activities. For them, it is more than just diet. It's living. Stay as healthy as physically possible. They even have a mandatory monthly massage. Never before have I seen such and enthusiasm to stay healthy. So these were midwives, right? These are all mm -hmm. midwives. The midwife in the white was the head midwife. She still is uh, one of our head doctors. This is uh, Dr. Ofra, Crown Dr. Ofra. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the first midwives as well as the other four. This was the first team of midwives that we had here in the community. Um, so so behind mm -hmm. you is our spiritual leader. Now, we'll keep taking a picture of him yet. No, I don't think so. Uh, this is our spiritual leader. Before 1972, uh, our sisters went to the hospital to have their babies. Yeah. And in the earlier days, uh, we were not treated as nicely okay. as uh, we would have wanted to. And so the sisters really had apprehension about going to the hospital. Yeah. So uh, this sister decided that she was going to put her baby in the hands, her <coughs> life and her baby in the hands of our midwives. So our midwives is the first baby delivered in the House of Life, 1972. And from this point on, uh, I would say 95 plus percent of all of our babies are born here in the House of Life. The okay. other 5%, there may be special circumstances that they may need to go to the hospital. Um, but at this time, um, we have a very good relationship with the midwives in the hospital in Soroka, which is the only hospital in the negative region, in the southern region. Yeah. And so when we do have to go to the hospital for any special circumstances that may happen with our mothers, we go to Soroka Hospital. And we're at a point now that when we walk in, the first thing they say is, why are you here? Because they know it has to be something that might be wrong. The process here in the Bay Kind is, um, and I'm going to bring it to the diet, is that along with the regular vegan diet that we have, we have a very special vegan diet for our expecting and nursing mothers. Um, what does that mean? When we speak about diet in a general sense, but also in a specific sense with our mothers, we don't speak of just food consumption. Diet is anything you ingest, what you think, what you eat, what you, uh, what you do with your body. Every, every aspect of what you do is part of your diet. It's a holistic, it's a holistic way of life, okay? Um, the mothers would let us know that they're in conception and then we would put them on this very special expecting and nursing mother's diet. And what makes it special is that it focuses on her making sure she gets her supplements, making sure she's eating properly throughout the day, getting enough water, 
um, juices, and exercise and rest. Because when we think of, as Sar mentioned earlier, our system of health is not a curative system. Our system of health is a preventive system. So we go at everything trying to pre prevent it before it becomes a dis-ease in the body, okay? So even with pregnancy, pregnancy is not a sickness. Pregnancy is a natural occurrence for women um, that are blessed to have that uh, occur with them. And so the mothers will let us know that they're in conception. They will come here um, when it's time to have the babies. And the team of midwives will be here to receive her. Um, and she will birth in this room or one of the other rooms that we'll show you in a moment. And um, she can birth in whatever position she would like to. Uh, this room can be transformed into a wonderful atmosphere of lights, candles, scents, aromas, uh, music. Um, my sister, my biological sister, is a sound therapist and she works with all types of percussion instruments and she will come and she will soothe the mother. She will play with, she plays the Tibetan bowls and she'll place them on the mother's uh, stomach and help to stimulate surges so that the baby can, can come out. It also helps to calm and relax the mothers. This is a solar cooker and mm -hmm. why would you want to cook food with the rays of the sun? First of all, because it maintains the in integral structure of your vegetables and your grains, okay? Uh, it will not totally uh, disrupt the nutritional value that's in food. But when you usually cook food on gas or electric stoves or even with wood, uh, you destroy the integral integrity of the food, okay? Here, you got another taste by cooking with the sun. Okay, and we require our families at least to have two meals a week cooked by the sun because it maintains and preserves the nutrients, okay? Real simple parabolic uh, panel that just uh, reflects the sun rays and there's a pot that goes there, usually an iron pot pot because in an iron pot, uh, you know, our elders used to cook in iron pots a lot a lot. Why? Because iron actually is absorbed by the food in the pot and with the sun hitting these types, these special pots from the bottom, the, um, the food actually absorbs more of the nutrient value of the iron that's in the pot, okay? Yeah. And so this is the garden, right? Right, that is a garden. Yeah. Uh, but we also have behind our school, we have uh, a greenhouse that uh, was awarded us because of the organic agriculture work that we were doing. Yeah. Uh, we were awarded this greenhouse in order to teach uh, African students uh, how to use greenhouses oh. you know, on the continent. Yeah. Okay, so we bring African students up here, you know, like it's a yeah. change program. And uh, we train them of how to grow various uh, uh, herbs and vegetables yeah. in their indigenous countries yeah. like Ghana, yeah. okay, like South Africa, like Kenya. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to talk, uh, talk to you about because mm -hmm. uh, in Norway there are many people who say that oh you can't grow um, enough vegetables to feed in the region population due to uh, that the, the, um, the soil is too scarce and such. Mm -hmm. uh, what, do you, what do you think that it's impossible to grow food in places where there grows a lot of rocks and such? All right, well, I think in terms of places like Norway, see, this is where the um, common concern for one another has to come in. Some lands have more than enough land that they need to propagate food for themselves. Maybe in Norway, you couldn't propagate or the foods that you would grow would sustain you, but You've got other countries that have plenty of land, for instance, like Africa. Okay, in Africa, you have millions of acres of land that uh, are arable, but they're not using them to produce food for their populace. So one of the, um, the uh, things, one of the principles that we are advocating is sharing 
resources. Some lands will be better, you know, suited to grow certain things, and other lands will be better suited to be everything. But the idea is to share these things. Yeah. Okay. Or you could put up a greenhouse or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So you you wouldn't say that it would be impossible to grow uh, vegetables up north if, as as far as you just put like. Um, um, the right intention into it, like um, with the greenhouse, yeah. you can control the environment. Yeah, you know? and and also I actually calculated this, and Norway actually has enough if people go vegan, but we don't have enough to produce enough meat. Right. Oh, absolutely! So, not. Yeah. The amount of water that animals consume, you know, when you're grazing cattle. Yeah. First of all, you have to cut trees down in order to uh, have the grasslands that the cattle will be feeding off yeah, exactly. of. Exactly. When you destroy your key, your trees, you destroy mm. your natural air conditioners of the planet. Also, what, what they say is that if we um, that uh, they, they have to graze cows there because you can't produce uh, food for humans there. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? <laughs> they have to raise what are the cows. cows. What are the cows <laughs> eating? Uh, grass because they're humans. Eating, they're eating the grains and the <laughs> herbs Absolutely. and yeah. the grass. They say that because uh, because humans can't eat grass, therefore we have to eat meat. Is what they say. Eating a cow is secondhand veganism. What I would like to uh, leave with our listening audience is that. Um, it's been a great experience uh, for us to receive uh, Piola and Uda here in Dimona, the home of the Hebrew Israelite community of Jerusalem. And I think, you know, you were already vegans, you know, yeah. you uh, told us. Yeah. And um, I think the meal that we just shared together validates why everybody in the world needs to be a vegan, okay? Um, because the food, you know, we could say was absolutely delicious. <laughs> so I'm putting an ad in that those of you that are thinking about becoming vegans or thinking about becoming a vegetarian, you need to come and visit, and visit the Village of Peace. Because we not only will offer you an opportunity that you will never receive nowhere else in the world, but we also hopefully will give you some keys of how you can regenerate your life, bring more happiness in your environment, bring more harmony in your environment, and bring more respect for people that you think are so much different than you. Because in just sitting and talking with you, we find that we have a lot of things in common. And one of the most important things that we must have in common is that we've got to always respect and give honor to that which created us. And what created us was this great creator that's all omnipotent, all omniscient, and all omnipresent. So if we can remember that we were all created by the same energy, the same consciousness, then we must find the bridges that bring us together as one people. But we want to remind our people, wherever they are on this planet, keep your eyes on Demona. Demona has become the spiritual capital of the world. Sila. As a person that is used to reading up on religion, I still find this very interesting. However, this might be a huge distinction between calling yourself religious and calling yourself spiritual. When religious people come up with excuses to consume animal products and use their religion as justification, Spiritual societies tend to do the exact opposite. It made me think, what if all religious groups were being just as passionate and ethical as these people? In next video, in the Galilee region, there is a village called Amirim. This was the first ever vegetarian village in all of Israel. Full of lush forests and nature all over. It is truly an idyllic place to visit. So next time, you will see us travel to a place that exceeded all of our expectations, far beyond anything we could have imagined. Stay tuned.